This is certainly not the liberated Europe we thought to build up. That was the only way we could find out, get any information on a closed, out of about a closed society. We shall pay any price, bear any burden. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. What is a Cold War? It's probably easier to start with a hot war. You know, a hot war would be a direct military confrontation between two major powers and, and all the carnage and destruction that would come from that. A Cold War is just a step down from that, where there's open hostility, there's open competition, there's, there's conflict short of military confrontation, and whether it's in economics, whether it's in diplomacy. You had this threat of nuclear Armageddon hanging over your heads all the time. It's post-World War II in the late 1940s. There are two nuclear superpowers, the United States and Soviet Union. Each government has developed a deep distrust of the other. Two worldviews compete, and a serious threat develops. Everyone was in one camp or the other. So it was, in some ways, it was a simpler world because it was bipolar. You're either for us or against us. You're either part of the free world or you're part of the communist bloc. My friends in Bulgaria, especially, are very, very, very angry uh, that they lived their, their, almost their entire adult lives under communist rule and we're not allowed to do and, and be free. And freedom's a, a, an issue that people don't understand today because they have so much of it. Early in the conflict, the biggest advantage for either side the hopes of humanity. was to have the most accurate intelligence about the enemy, its capabilities, and its intentions. It was a war of information, and it did have its casualties. One of the greatest peacetime spy dramas in the nation's history. In 1953, the United States executed Julius and Ethel Rosenberg for selling atomic secrets to the Russians. A few years later, Russia shot down a U-2 spy plane piloted by Francis Gary Powers. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. We must get ready for it. Over everything in civilian life, there hung a pall of worry and fear that moved families to build backyard bomb shelters and schools to hold duck and cover drills. And you saw the discussions on, about the, uh, the possibilities of nuclear war on television and watch movies like Failsafe and Dr. Strangelove about nuclear Armageddon. So it, it kind of permeated the, your reality. As a kid, I don't think I ever really took that serious. Uh, it did become serious after I joined the Navy and got into a, an airplane that was designed actually to, uh, to be a nuclear delivery platform and, uh, and then actually mapped out the target, the route to the target and that mission. Then it, uh, then it hit home. Fear reached a terrifying peak in the early 60s as the installation of missiles by the U.S. in Turkey and Italy led to a response by the Soviets to put their missiles within 100 miles of the United States on the communist-controlled island of Cuba. You have, of course, the, the, the flare-up around the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, where we probably come the closest we ever have to actually having nuclear warfare. And to be sure, there was still plenty of heat in this era. Two large-scale conflicts in Korea and Vietnam. They were no different than any other U.S.-involved war. Brave Americans put themselves in harm's way in pursuit of a greater good, in this case, stopping the spread of communism. It was the, uh, the domino theory that uh, was talked about a lot back in those days where if one country goes uh, communist, the next one, uh, the, the country next to it would go next and so on until Communism 
took over the, all of the countries in the region. Pennsylvania native Will Deliker, a fighter pilot in the Vietnam War, flew 200 missions before he turned 20 years old. The uh, A-4 was uh, an air-to-ground delivery bomber. Uh, our primary mission was dropping six 500-pound bombs on roads that were designated to be uh, closed uh, to uh, prevent the supplies from moving south. The later years of the Cold War witnessed a massive buildup of arms as the U.S. and USSR each stockpiled enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world many times over. As one power would escalate its military capabilities and technology, the other would spend any amount of time and treasure to catch up. The United States and Russia at that time had this uh, policy that was called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. And that policy meant that if either uh, the United States or the Russia and Warsaw Pact countries would launch a nuclear bomb, on, the, on one of the uh, NATO countries, the retaliation would be a full force uh, military nuclear war. It was the kind of thing you lose sleep uh, overnight if, uh, if the balloon ever went up, as we'd call it, and we had to uh, launch uh, with our nuclear weapons. Uh, that, was, uh, that was probably the end, of, the end of the world as we know it. This atmosphere of mutually assured destruction kept a strange peace between the two superpowers and across the globe, but it also allowed for the unimaginable possibility of either side making an apocalyptic mistake in judgment. There was always this fear that, you know, that somebody might make a mistake or, or would an inside threat would somehow do something to spark a nuclear war, and it's, it's, there were immense uh, uh, preparations made to make sure that would not happen. By the mid-80s, the world had endured nearly four decades of the threat of nuclear war and human extinction. It seemed time for a change, especially to the two countries responsible for this tension. There are really two key players, two very key players in the, in the end of the Cold War and the eventual break with the Soviet Union. One is Ronald Reagan, the other is Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, Reagan builds up American military power, builds up American will, American pride, American prestige, presents a very bellicose and strong image to the world. What Mikhail Gorbachev was doing in the Soviet Union, he was letting new, you know, he was letting the genie out of the bottle. He was starting to let with perestroika and letting people talk freely and all of a sudden a lot of the flaws in the system started to come to the fore and, and he allowed it to. And this flow of new information, this flow of, of increased freedom uh, in the Soviet bloc is eventually what helped do it in. An historic treaty brought a drastic reduction in U.S. and Soviet missiles. The arms race itself collapsed Russia's economy and led to the breakup of the Soviet Union. You know, a key part of the Cold War was this, this battle of ideas, that our way was better than their way. And, and that if we, one of the uh, key aspects of containment was the idea was we could contain the Soviet Union Eventually, their system would self-destruct, that this, uh, this, the beacon of freedom in the end would win out. The final powerful symbol of the end was the dismantling of the Berlin Wall. The U.S. policy for a half century was to contain communism. The destruction of the wall meant those who were contained by communism were now free. For many, many years, uh, four decades, they just lived in, in, in repression and divided from uh, you know, extended families and, and friends. Uh, when the wall went up, they just were not allowed to go back and forth any longer. And at the same time, uh, apprehension about you know, what's to come, what's the future going to hold. But what did it mean for the lone remaining superpower? In many ways, the world becomes more chaotic. You don't have the Soviet Union and the United States to try to stabilize areas, so you have a lot more instability. We do have the rise of extremist groups and this global instability. And what place in history and in public conscience do America's cold warriors occupy? We didn't do an armed combat type situation, but nonetheless, it was, it was a standoff. And it was, it was a strong standoff that every single day, 24 hours a day, we aimed our weapons at each other in the form of tanks and, and artillery um, and just you never knew when, when things were going to happen. 
Cold War veterans deserve a lot more credit than they get. They do tend to be kind of overlooked when people have fought in Vietnam or fought in Korea. Sun Tzu, in his doctrine, talks about the fact that the, the, the epitome of uh, success in war is being able to win a war without fighting. And in many ways, that's what the Cold Warriors do. The Cold Warriors, because of the strength that they embody, because of the images they put forth, because of their dedication, they win a war without fighting. They win the Cold War without fighting. To those who served America from 1947 through 1991, the period popularly known as the Cold War, thank you for your sacrifice and your commitment to peace and freedom for all.